Do you like comeback stories? If you do, you're in for a treat. Our guest is Speaker Tom Winninger. He's given speeches at more than 3,000 conferences all over the country. For nearly 30 years, Tom built a successful career as America's market strategist. It's not what I sell, it's what the customer buys that differentiates me in the marketplace. It's not what I sell, it's what the customer buys that differentiates me in the marketplace. If I'm busy trying to figure out what I sell rather than what the customer wants to buy, I will always be competing on a product line that is focused on a price issue rather than a value issue in the marketplace. As a member of the National Speakers Association, he won the coveted Cavett Award, and in 1997, he won NSA's prestigious CPAE Award. What do those things mean to you, Tom? Well, I, I'm humbled in the reality that somebody awards me for something that I love to do and care to do and, and probably given the talent and the gifts to use and, and give. That uh, Cabot Award is given once each year by the 3,000 members of the National Speakers Association to somebody who has served the future and the foundation of the National Speakers Association. This happens to be a Cabot. And, uh, and CPAE is, a, is an award and honor that inducts you into the Speaker Hall of Fame. So, you know, we all put plaques on the walls, but it's who we are and not what we attain that brings us plaques on the wall that makes a difference in our life. But that's nice of you. Thank you. When I started speaking, I went to a meeting and Cavett Robert was the main speaker. And I went up to him. I heard an audio cassette about him. I said, man, you are a good speaker. I really like you. I want to be like you. I want to be a public speaker. Guess how he started his speech. Before I start the speech, I want to introduce you to somebody. He looked down. John Gross. That meant everything <laughs> in the world to me, and it that did. sort of shows his heart. And I think that's why people were so attracted to Cavett, is that the reality of his nature that attracted and focused on others rather than himself. Tom and I have been uh, good friends for years. Uh, we grew up in neighboring towns in Iowa. I'm from Cedar Falls, Iowa, and he's from a much bigger city, Waterloo, Iowa. It's about three <laughs> miles from there. There's a lot of argument over that, by the way. <laughs> Tom, Not between us, but... What was it like growing up? What was it like in grade school for you? Uh, well, a couple of things. First of all, I, I found that my youth was simpler than our kids have today. And I think the challenge is to understand what simple means in your life, to be, bring clarity to what you're doing. Uh, I had a comeback kid, you know, I ended up in third grade two and a half times, uh, actually was sight impaired and in a classroom with, you know, uh, 58 kids. 20 feet wide, 40 feet long, you can't see a chalkboard. And my name is Winninger, so I was next to the Zooks and the Zimmermans. And I couldn't see what's going on in the front of the room for about two years. They finally gave me uh, eye correction uh, analysis and found out I needed glasses, serious needed glasses. And uh, God bless the teacher, she, she moved me to fourth grade. <laughs> was but it was hard. You know, it, the, when something happens to you in your life that derails you or you think does, you don't see the good in it. You see the challenge in it. And I think that's part of the message that I've carried with me all my life is good comes out of almost everything if you know where to look for it. Because there's reasons things happen. And, and that experience in third grade, as, as elementary as it might appear to most people, changed the view of my life. Because I realized that to really be successful, I had to be a good student. And they needed to find some resilience in knowing things that for one reason or another, other people wanted to know but didn't know where to find them. And that kind of built the foundation of my whole speaking and writing career in third grade. I didn't realize that at the moment. At the moment, it was like saying goodbye to my friends because they were moving on to the next grade and the next grade, and I caught up with my sister. So we pretended we were twins all the way through high school. <laughs> was it humiliating? Uh, very. The, ch the challenge you have in it is not to demise anything, but you're on the playground playing with who? Who are you playing with? Your class is gone that you came through first and second and part of third grade with, and you haven't caught up with the class that you're with now, but which is a year behind the class you were with before. But it was meant to be. And I'm confirmed so grateful in my life that I had that experience that, that really brought me to a challenge and focus, that really made me a student, made me committed, and help me look for the things people wanted to know that they didn't know. And how could I help them with that? Coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. Yeah, that's a Tom, good one. Tom, it was supposed to happen. 
Oh, you know, no, absolutely. supposed to happen to you. Absolutely. It gave me a couple of advantages for some of you realize that I was the oldest kid in my class, and by the time I got to high school, I had a car. <laughs> so I had like 52 girlfriends <laughs> until they got cars, and then I realized that they weren't my girlfriends. And, but there was an advantage all the way along. And even now at reunions, you know, when I go back to reunions, you know, they always honor me as the oldest guy in the class. And oh, that is so you gotta have, you gotta have, you gotta have fun with this stuff. So how did, how in the world did you get into speaking? I mean, with that background in grade school, how did you get into public speaking? Well, a lot of people come to me. I, I meet with a lot of people who call me on the phone and want to sit down and talk about what's happening in their life, where their purpose is, how they discover purpose in their life, what their gifts and talents are. And I truly believe the career came to me. I didn't rush to it. It wasn't something I saw. It. I'm, like you, John, I was in broadcasting in Milwaukee in Channel 4, uh, journalist, typically behind the camera, not in front of the camera. And uh, that job changed and I ended up with a bank holding company. And everywhere I went, I had the chance to present something. And I never thought about it. So when I was with the bank, I was the director of marketing for the bank, uh, and the president would send me out to our clients' meetings. And, not, and I found out they didn't want to hear about the bank, they want to hear about how things affected them in their business. And so I started collecting this. And then I moved back to Waterloo, Iowa, got in my dad's construction business because he said, you have a higher potential for, for success here with me than you do anywhere else. <laughs> and I believed him. <laughs> Don't get me started on that one. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I started speaking locally with the same thing is, what do people want to hear that affects them that I might know something about? Not necessarily me and where I'm coming from. Go to them. Was this way back in Waterloo? This was way back in Waterloo. This was in 1975, 76, and 77. And then uh, I sold some stock I owned in my dad to my brother, and it, it launched me nationally as, as a visible entity. Because it, we were in real estate, and, you know, it's a small industry. People think it's big, but people know what's going on. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a bouncy thing. And they had heard that I did this, and I started being invited to father and son meetings with business guys in the real estate and construction business. And they wanted to know how I did that and why I did that and what effect that had on them. Because family business is tough. And that really became my venue then. Some of you might know uh, Toro and Ken Melrose. Ken Melrose heard me speak once and said, you know, I have 14,000 dealers in America who need to hear your message. And I signed on to be a spokesperson for this concept of you lead, you don't compete. If you compete, you'll never lead. If you lead, you never compete. It's not by watching somebody else to figure out where you need to be going because innately you have within you everything you need to do to be successful. And that was my banter primarily for manufacturers with their deal organizations and Harley and Steel and Trek Bicycle and, and those kinds of companies. Tom Winninger's keynote presentations are igniting new momentum for corporations and associations worldwide. His strategies have been captured in five best-selling books, including Bullseye, How to Capture Market Leadership, and Price Wars, How to Win the Battle for Your Customer. Tom's been featured on CNBC, First Business, Boardroom Reports, Venture, and Success Magazine. He's published in over 300 trade journals, publications, and newspapers. Tom Winninger has received many awards and commendations, including a nomination for America's Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Tom started to speak to big companies, and by the time he was 53, he achieved remarkable success. And you completed your budget <coughs> list at 53. I did. Fast forward to October 23rd, 2001. Where were you on that day, and what happened? Uh, well, the bucket thing was, was important to me. I wanted to be free of 53, and this bucket th thing was a big, idea. you know, they made a movie after that about somebody else's bucket list and how you get these things done, and then you've arrived somewhere and you don't know where you've arrived. Uh, I was in uh, Grapevine, Texas, at a hotel that's very famous, on the ninth floor, headed down to speak to another 150 people, which was my average audience size, 150, and uh, the dealers, and I started to cry. I got on the elevator, and I'm sobbing on the elevator. I had nine floors to cry to death, you know, and, <laughs> and I, I hit one, I hit, went down to one and the door opened and I was still crying. So I closed the door, <laughs> I hit nine, went back up and I got back up to nine. And I said, you got to go down there and speak. This is another group that contracted with you. So I hit one again. I get down there and the meeting planner standing outside the elevator because they're ready to do my introduction. And he said, are you going to speak or what? And I said, yeah, I don't remember what I said, but I went in and spoke. And, and that day I began the journey that made me realize that 
the challenge for me is to apply my content and focus on understanding and truth to a higher level, and that is to the person, not the business. And I realized that at that point in my own self, I had to refocus where I was going, not change my content, but refocus my content to a higher level of need. And that was the journey that, that uh, took me back to philosophy and theology. I went back to school, got my master's in philosophy and theology. And it didn't, I, I didn't want my master's, but I wanted to understand the truths of life. And are they convergent with the truths of business? And it is amazing to me. The same thing I was teaching is the same thing I'm talking about now. It's just here I'm talking about what's it for you and who are you supposed to be rather than what you become. It's the same way I was doing with business. What, who are you, John Deere, and what have you become, and how do you get back to what you were meant to be? Are you a tractor manufacturer? Or are you helping the farmer's life be easier? There's a total difference for me between those two things. And uh, that's what I'm doing today. How much have you grown in spirit? Oh, huge for me. I, I, I learned in philosophy and discovered that, that there is a divine intent for all of us. There's something bigger than us in all our life. And if we sit down and reflect upon things that came to us that we had nothing to do with, we, are, we become very confirmed in the fact that, that something's bigger than us in our life. I call it divine intent. And when things don't work, like falling off the horse or whatever it is, that's usually divine intervention. That means you're on the wrong track and you, the divine intent in your life is going to wake you up. And uh, in my faith, which has really deepened my faith and hope in the reality that something's happening in my life bigger than me, and you better clarify it and engage it and hang on to it, it is amazing. It's amazing. I mean, I'm 70 years old and I'm speaking as much, not for money, as speech, speaking as much as I was at the peak of my career. I'm in front of as many audiences as I was then with similar content with a different focus. Like, like for example, guy gets to be 55 years old, he, think he thinks he has everything, then he wakes up and he found out the things he got were, were worthless and the stuff he missed was priceless. <laughs> you know, what, no, meaning, purpose, fulfillment in your life at 55. That's a tough nut, but you got everything else. You know, you've run the ladder up, you've done a good job, you've worked hard, you know, but, but what, did you, what should you really gotten? How many guys under 32, young people do I meet that have the same problem? They call me on the phone and they say, I got a career and I can't get a job. I say, well, that's the problem. You got a career and you didn't get you. You didn't come in college to discover the reality of who you were. You decided that there's a career orientation you're gonna build your life around, and a career, a job is not you. It's what you do in the job that's you. They're totally different things. So how do you find purpose under 32 years old that sustains you your whole life? Because people change jobs, and then, or they lose their job. And they say, well, they lose their identity because their job was their identity. identity. That's a huge philosophical and theological mistake. Are you happier than you've ever been? I'm more joyful than I've ever been. What's I gave up on the happy deal. What's the difference? Well, happy, happy is, is, is secular and joy is sacred to me. Really? So, yeah, happiness can't, you know, I, I've had a lot of happiness in my life. <laughs> you know, you get this, you can be real happy in front of 4,000 people. You know, you get, you get a plane, you can fly around, you can be real happy for a while until you realize you can't afford the plane anymore. Uh, that's all happiness stuff to me. It's, it's things that, that go away. The beauty of joy is it comes out of things that aren't working. So the foundation of the joy is typically a failure, not a success. Isn't that interesting? Joy isn't related to success at all. Joy is related to fulfillment. The fuller you are, the more joyful you are. And you say, well, what's fulfillment? Well, fulfillment is realizing that there's something that you can do that other people can't do, and you've learned to apply it to help other people understand what it is they should do. I talk a little fast, but... I love, I love your sights because of the quotes and the material on there, there are hundreds of videos. It's all free, and it's all Tom Winninger. And it's only three minutes each. Three minutes each, and you do that. Three minutes, purpose. that's it. That's all people will watch. Is Tom can share his whole brain in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Winninger lives in the belief that everyone has an innate gift imbued in them at birth. What yeah. does that mean? So I think that there's a characteristic that we get at birth in conception, in, in creation, that sets us apart and draws us to the opportunities we get in our life. Like, like character for me is insight. Now, I, I cannot guarantee you that that's my gift, but it fulfills 
the application to confirm it. So in other words, and that's what I do for businesses. So when, when Harley calls me on the phone, I do a little research project for Harley, and I come back with an insight for them. And I've done 3,000 insights for 3,000 different manufacturers in the world in 40 years. And typically, 3,000 3, Including insights. John Deere in Waterloo, Iowa. That's right. It's about making the farmer's life easier. It's not about ma manufacturing a tractor that's a different color. <laughs> well, no, and, and in all honesty, I, I, I support everything. I mean, I was born in Waterloo, Iowa, the mecca of John Deere. But I believe that John Deere tries harder to be what it needs to be than anybody else. It's like with Mayo Clinic. The challenge for Mayo is not medicine, it's health. And they've made that now 360. Now they're talking about health and maintaining health and understanding your health rather than just figuring out when you're sick how they can apply a medication or medicine to it. And I think that was the Mayo Brothers when they started. I have a little inside track because our daughter for a while was working in oncology at Mayo. So I watched a little bit of this insight. But that's in everything. It's in us. So each one of us has what I call a single characteristic, divine natural attribute, I call it, DNA. Yeah. And, uh, and our goal in life is to discover what that is and then look at the opportunities that come to us to apply it, which gives us the satisfaction and the meaning and the fulfillment and the purpose. So in my own life, if I slow this down for you, if I can, if I can help you understand truth in your life and show you how to apply it by clarifying what opportunities are coming to you, you're going to be more, have a more meaningful, purposeful, and fulfilled life. I mean, and in 55 minutes you can do this, or 50. When you gave speeches before, and you were out for a paycheck, what was it like? And now, people's reaction now, speaking from where you're at now, right. what is the reaction like, and is it different than when it was just after the paycheck? Well, uh, two things. My, my father always taught me that you, you create value and then you put a price tag on it. So I always work very hard to deliver more than I, they were expecting for what they were paying. And I tell young people that. I say, be worth more than your salary and you'll never have to worry about your future. The difference between getting a paycheck and being there and not getting a paycheck and being there, and I, I still, I'm still paid but nowhere near what I was when I was on the corporate platform. Really? Yeah. More, and now it's more a contribution to sustain the movement that, that I've started with the book. But, but people want a longer relationship with you now than they did before because I believe their perception is if you're not sending them a bill, then you're giving from your heart. It's a tough, con it's a tough concept to, to, to come to terms with because I'd still like the paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it is it, it, still like the paycheck but but the the money is meaningless to me fortunately i've had a great career i'm totally filled with gratitude yeah, i learned to be a great receiver not just a great giver because people who receive well are also people who give well and uh yeah now after what you learned in 2001 are you tighter with your family are you tighter with people with everybody there isn't a day goes by i don't call somebody and tell them i love them Seriously. Really? Yeah, I was thinking about you. I love you. Margaret, yesterday, I called her. She's almost 91. I called her yesterday, and I don't know Margaret really well, but, but once in a while I connect with her over something because she gets my daily reflections. What reaction do you get? I love you, too. That's what they say. I love you, too. I said, well, I was just thinking about what you're on my mind. Now, I used to do that for different reasons in corporate America, and I didn't say I loved them. I said I was thinking about them. Uh -huh. But it's a similar approach. I call clients on the phone, leave a message on their, their voicemail that, that, you know, I was thinking about them today and wondered if there's anything I could do for them. So it's, it's an instinct that's characteristic in us and, and to develop and to do that. Tom is one of a kind, and he's written several books. How many books have you written? No, and, just seven. I heard a guy yesterday, he's got 59 books. I went, I am lazy. <laughs> <laughs> or, or as uh, <laughs> now what's the one about DNA? Yeah, the DNA. Th that 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 was the book that came out of the my epiphany, and I didn't want to write. I didn't want to write DNA. Um, I'd written six books. I had written one other reflection book. Uh, we all say they're on the top ten bestseller list, but I never found it on whatever list they were talking about. <laughs> but uh, but the editor from my book, Get Out of the Boat and Discover the Meaning of Your Life, which was the sixth book called me on the phone. She said, you're writing another book. I said, I'm not writing another book. Candace is her name. 
And she said, yes, I know you're writing another book, and I'm going to edit it for you. Wow. And I said, okay, um, how are we going to do this? She said, well, you do a journal, don't you? And I said, yeah. Well, she just said, send me your journal. I said, well, I'm going to send you my journal. <laughs> and then I got thinking about it. I thought, okay, well, I've never done that before, but let her reflect on my journal. So I took some stuff out of the journal. And she, she, she called me back after she got it, and she said, there's a book in here. And the book was this whole epiphany change and how, how did I acknowledge my gift? How did I qualify my gift? How did I apply my gift? How did I find clarity with my gift? And how did that lead to meaning, fulfillment, and purpose in my life? And that's the book. And it's 10 passages on the, the things you need to go through to get to a point in your life where you feel the joy, you feel the clarity, you're confirmed in the fact you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. It's like you and these things, John. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much confirmation are you getting out of these? This is amazing. And, and yet you think about the journey of you getting here. It takes a while. You know, you don't wake up overnight and figure out what it is because it's a journey. And I, I honestly believe in my own theology that we'll never really know until we meet the, our creator. The, the, the real truth and perfection is going to come. <laughs> when, when he said, you did a good job, good and worthy servant. Or he's going to say, you missed it, <laughs> but I'm going to keep you anyway, you know. So anyway. You're amazing. Did I answer your question? You answered okay. my question. <laughs> Tom's own gift is the ability to help people look within themselves, unpack their gift, and apply its purpose to realize their full potential. So you don't look outside, you look inside. You don't try to get success or happiness on the outside, but go within. That's right. I'll give you an example. So, so guys call me on the phone and things have changed in their career or whatever, and they go, well, I said, I bet you've been running around talking to your friends about what you should do now with your life. That's a mistake, personally. In other words, they're not you. They're never going to be you. And they'll tell you what they would do, they would do, if they were you. So it misses you altogether. <laughs> I tell people, I said, look, figure out what you think it is that you should be doing and go out and tell them what you've decided to do and see what their reaction is. That's a better way to do it. But it's inside. It's a meeting with yourself. And most of us aren't good at reflection. I mean, you know, we, we fill our life with everything. And now it's worse than ever, you know. Uh, how many things do I watch that I'm not interested in, but I watch them anyway because it gives me a chance to, to escape from myself, you know, veg. veg <laughs> we need to limit the vegging and get to know on the, the, the verging. You know, the getting to know yourself. But Augustine said that. that that's, that's Aristotle. Aristotle said, you is not outside you. It's inside you related to outside you. Start with you first and then go out and you'll discover what it is you're supposed to be doing. There's lots of that stuff. But, and they're simple. Truth is so simple because, you know, I had a college professor and I went to him, Dr. Michael Naughton. And uh, he's, I love him. He's a great guy. And he's very insightful and he's, he's very popular. And... Uh, and I, I was mouthing off that I have all these truths. And he said, no, you don't. I said, yes, I do. He said, no, you don't. <laughs> I'm arguing with my professor. <laughs> and I, he said, yes, yes. He said, they're not your truths. Truth owns you. You do not own truth. If you, if you fight truth, it wins over time. Truth will win. Truth will win. I was in TV sports and TV news for 40 years. Amazing five, career. Five days a week, had stuff on the Today Show and Good Morning America, won six Emmys. And I look back, <clears throat> I retired three years ago, and I'm happier now than I have ever been doing what I'm doing now. And I think this is the real purpose for me. I think this is my DNA to invite people like Tom Winninger to come and talk yeah. about life. Well, you know, the beauty of you, John, is, you know, and we've known each other a long time. Now, we didn't know each other when we were growing up. But uh, maybe I would have done better. But, <laughs> but I, John is like the TED Talk of interviews for me. You know, he capsulizes the, the significant things in a brief interview and brings them to the attention of others. That is the interview TED Talk. That, that's what I think you're doing. Not making any money at it, but, you know, doing stuff like this is more important to me than money is. is do you feel that way? Did you oh, get to but that it comes. Area? It comes. The, the, that's the problem is, you know, I started off speaking because, because I was passionate about the message I was sharing with other family-owned small companies. I was passionate about the wonderful people I got a chance to revolve around, like Fred White at Steel Chainsaw or Ken Melrose or, right. or uh, these, are, these are amazing people, you know. Um, and, and they were stimulated not by the money the company was making, but by the way they were serving people. 
And so I felt very comfortable. The paycheck, the importance of the paycheck grew as, as I diminished. So in other words, as I got busier, and I was doing it more just to get it done, and you're doing 80 speeches a year. I mean, you're, you're in 80 communities for an hour, two hours speaking, a flight at two o'clock, another hotel room, three days a week, 10 months of the year. The audience, unfortunately, becomes unimportant. And then it's just another gig, it's another performance, it's another check. That's when it started getting derailed. When I focused on the money rather than the value of what I was delivering to the uniqueness of the people in the audience that needed to hear a message and engage them in changing their life or their business or refocus. It's like people who all of a sudden forget why they're in business and then find out that they're just trying to survive against a competitor. You, you might as well get rid of it. Get out. Get out. The market is too competitive today to try to win by rumping your head against the rear end of some other business and figure out what they're doing so you can do it better. That's Processionary Caterpillar, by the way. That's. <laughs> <laughs> Check somebody else out to see how you can be better. There is no better. There's unique, different gift. Is that what it's all about? That's what it's all about. I mean, I haven't had anybody argue with me. And everybody who tries it calls me back and says, wow, I have more insights today than I've ever had. I have more joy today than I've ever had. I'm not quite where I want to be yet. Always, but we're not supposed to be at, at the end yet. I'm not all that I can be, and I'm not all that I should be. Right. But thank God, I'm not what I used to be. That's <laughs> Les Brown. That's right. <laughs> Isn't he amazing? Every day and every way, I'm getting a little bit better. That was a Les Brown, too. Every day and every way, I'm getting a little bit better. The challenge is to define what better means so that you can actually feel some, some level of arrival, even when you don't have a level of arrival. You know. Have you and, seen him live? Yeah, absolutely. Four or five times, I mean. I trained his staff. He hired me to train his staff, paid me a little bit, and I teach, taught his staff how to run a speaker business because I had 12 people staff running my business. And Les always wondered, because speakers don't, don't we, we can't run companies. <laughs> we tell other people how to run their company, and then it gets back to ours, you know, and we got high turnover and things. Like that. So anyway. When it comes to speaking, Minnesota's a, a hotbed. Um, we have Joe Schmidt, my former boss at KSTP, yeah. He is skyrocketing up the, the speaking. Um, and Janie Jason, Janie who Jason. Was in NSA, and yeah, Mark like Scherenbrock. Said, yep, Mark. Yep. Mike, uh, Mark LeBlanc. Mark LeBlanc, yes. Is a powerful presence in the, in the category. And um, Mike McKinley, he's past president C C B and he has a cabinet. Really? So there's two of these little 25 pound. <laughs> <laughs> Statues running around Minnesota. What's going to Although happen? you don't take it anywhere, it's 25 pounds. What's going to happen if you see that on eBay? Oh, there you go. <laughs> I think the association would call me. <laughs> no, there, there are a number of speakers. And not only that, but you've got thousands of people in Toastmasters. Right. And they all want to be where you were, not right. so much the speaking circuit. But they want to get better. Right. Uh, the challenge is not to want to be a speaker. The challenge is to want to understand a message that so energizes other people that it changes their life in one way or another, or their business. And, and the speaking will come with it. The speaking will come with it. So how does someone prepare a speech? I think that's the hardest part of me with Toastmasters, was just finding beginning, middle, end, which right. I did with TV storytelling. But what, can you talk about storytelling and how to give a speech? Should you well, use, read a speech? Should you use notes? Never read. Never read. Stumble through it, if you, but don't <laughs> read it. Don't read it. Don't read it. There's a model that, that's relatively simple. It says you, you open with an attention getter or an anchor. Something that gets their attention to the fact there's something valuable they need to listen to. Like I give statistics. I say the market's based on 17% value customers, 27% coupon clippers and 56 in the more, more middle or they're so confused they're driving companies out of business because the companies <laughs> don't know how to relate. Don't, and in the next five years, many of you will be out of business. That's, and then I tell a little story about that. So I start with an anchor. I tell a story to anchor that in their mind. Stories are used to anchor points in people's mind. They remember the story so they can remember the points. They don't remember the points without a story. So that's critical. So that's your open. Then you have three or four things that they need to do as a result of that. I call them truths or concepts. So I give them three or four concepts. Each concept has a story, and then it has a way to apply it in their life on a daily basis. And then finally, I have a closing signature story 
that hopefully brings them to understand that they want more of this. So that's kind of the package, as you said, you know, start, middle, and, but, but these old philosophies about tell them what you're gonna tell them, you know, uh, tell them what you told them, all, don't worry about that. Get, get, get it deeply enough into your material. And the other thing is you can't be a good speaker if you're not speaking. No, no, in all honesty, you know, you know, I was doing, even at my minimum, I was doing 50 a year. Well, when you're in front of 50 audiences a year, that's one a week, you're using material. And you're, you're honing material. Was it the same speech over and over 50 times? Well, I had six different speeches, around six different concepts. So, no, it wasn't that. The, the, and they were all customized to the group. So I would call five or six people who were going to be in attendance and ask them what they want to hear. <laughs> what's that? No, more, more specifically, what, what's their biggest challenge? Uh, what's terminology that they use that if I incorporate it into my speech, they'd feel like I did my homework? Those, what do they think about in the shower? You know, I don't care about that, but what do they think about in the shower? In other words, what's on their mind all the time? Even if I'm not speaking about it, you know, like, like, for example, uh, small dealers would tell me, well, I can't find people who are committed to my, my business. Well, I don't talk about people in business. I talk about value and pricing and comp competition and leadership. But if I sensed that that was something they were dealing with, it came out in my underlying tone. And then they said, well, this guy really knows me. How well do I know the audience? And that's really how we guide ourselves. If you are speaking and you get a chance to speak, put out a little card at the end uh, on each of the tables and ask them how you did on content one through 10, how you did on engagement one through 10, how you did on energy one through 10, and what you talked about you want to know more about. That's critical. And then you, the next question is what you didn't talk about they wish you would have talked about. If they have you back, they'll do it. That's the little card that guided my career forever. How that did it help? Card. Did it help? Did it oh. get your bookings? Oh, huge, huge. Over 50% of my bookings will repeat for that reason, for that reason. Most speakers don't ask to come back. I asked to come back. And I had a little checkbox at the bottom, have him back. And I turned those into the meeting planner. And as the meeting planner called me and said, we've never had so many requests for a speaker come back. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> he said, but I know how you did it. <laughs> you asked him to check the box. I said, yeah, I asked him to check the box. So if, if people are just starting out, I mean, right. do you write out a speech? Or do you write out three or four words and go with six or seven points like that? I, What's advice for people to... I don't coach ready? people in speaking, but <clears throat> I would start with concepts. What concept do you want to present? And then turn a recorder on and present it without writing it out. And get used to doing that. Get used to dancing around a concept. Now, I, have I watched things on video? Have I had people transcribe me? All of that stuff. But I think my style, my open style, you know, I'm in a, a protrusion stage environment typically. So in other words, my setup with an audience requires me to be on a walkout, not a walk by. What's that mean, walk that means that, that means along the wall there's four or five uh, risers, mm -hmm. and then I stick a T in it. Ah. And so I've got audience, like on a TV audience, right. I've got audiences all around me, so I can look over here and I can look over here. The, to me, there's more energy in that setup, I've, and I've proved that than a standard classroom setup. So I get more energy. So I'm really in their face. And you can't read notes out there. You can't carry cards out there. No, 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 no. You have to use your hands to, in, to hug them. If you're hugging a paper, you're not hugging <laughs> them because you're so worried about what you're going to forget because that's why people read it. They think the written word is more powerful than the spoken word. I disagree. I have, you know, today I, I do some preaching around the country. And I do, I do write them out in advance and then I throw them away. I you do write it for them down formulation. And throw it away. I do it for formulation. So I write it out and it's about 800 words. They're short little bips, about, you know, eight minutes. And then I identify the, the, the sections by concept and then I get rid of it. And then I preach from the concepts. How long is how long is the eight message? minutes? Eight minutes. Yeah, well, it takes me eight hours to do one. Your site. They're not in the winter side. But if you search YouTube, uh, Deacon Winninger or preaching, they'll they'll show up. What's it mean to be a deacon? Uh, total commitment. There's something important in your life, as, and you're a servant to the Lord. You're ordained to a servant to the in the Lord. 
They, everybody comes first, not you. Everybody before you. Yeah, everybody before you. Yep, everybody before you. And that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I, I, I like to count the number of people in an audience. That's a mistake. You know, I used to, you know, I, I told you I had 156, actually. On the average, in 40 years, I had 156 people. How do I know that number? Because I had every audience counted and averaged. Really? I know. I know. And why was that? I don't know. It's all ego. Edging God out, you know. It's all... <laughs> You're one of a kind, guy. You really think so? No, I really think so. <laughs> Yes, don't you I don't agree? know I was birthed this way. <laughs> no, you are one of a kind. I love your attitude. I've never met anyone like you with that attitude. Well, you're very I'm so, nice. so proud of you for what you've done. You're very nice. But th th that's the point with all of us. Let yourself come through. People want to know the person they can talk to off the platform just like the person they talk to on the platform. I meet friends of mine that have dual uh, identities. On the platform, they're one thing, and off the platform, they're another. Can you imagine the tension between those two things? That's high tension. You've seen that before? Oh, I, I see it a lot. I see it a lot. So when they're on the stage, they're all up and ready to go and raving. And right, then and then off the stage, they're, they're upset about the food, they're upset about the bed, they're upset about everything. You know, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You've got to be one or the other. Be good, good, or be bad, bad, but don't be good one day and bad the next, or good one hour and bad the next hour. There's no credibility. If you are an SOB... Be a good example of an SOB. <laughs> you know, we say, no, but, but I know people who run businesses who aren't the nicest people, but, and, and they get some of the best people working for them because they're consistently that way. If, if, you are, if you are full of energy, you should be full of energy all the time. Now, that doesn't mean you're tired. There's a difference here. That doesn't mean I don't take a nap. But, but I, when somebody approaches me, I'm excited about it, as excited as I am on the platform. Anybody. Anybody. Why not? Because I see an opportunity I'm meant to be in everybody I meet within reason. Wow. I, I, you know, God love my father. You know, I worked for dad for a little while and he was working on some commercial buildings and this guy in this old pickup drives in front of my dad's office building and dad had all this glass so you could sit in there and look out and see who's coming in. And this guy gets out with the old overalls and the torn and the dirt and, the, and he's got a can. And he walks in and he said, Larry, I want to buy one of your buildings. Well, the average take on this would be, this guy doesn't have anything to buy a commercial building that houses a doctor's office. And, uh, but he did. <laughs> I think he bought 10 of them. <laughs> and his down payment was in the can. <laughs> I say, how many times do we, you know. Oh, my god! I think about this. I think, don't, get out of judgment. You know, everybody has something excited in them to share. Maybe they don't always know how to do it. But everyone has something to share. And every one of us fails to succeed. In other words, we fail before we succeed. Because usually what we end up doing comes out of our fall, not out of our rise. The challenge for the books that I've written have come because there were things that didn't work. And my experience with things that didn't work that enlightened me to the things that could work. I wanted a job with uh, NFL Films really bad. And I thought, I got a tryout. It was amazing. But I had a new camera. I hadn't used it before. Really? I mean, it was really bad. I didn't know how to turn the things, and I missed every big play. And I called NFL Films the next day. Hey, what'd you think? <laughs> missed that one. <laughs> they waited about 30 seconds before they said, it stunk. It was horrendous. I don't even know why you tried out and hung up on me. Well, there you go. And then ended up being number one NFL Films guy in the country. For the next day it started trying to be better every way I could at least an hour a day. The next year to the date I was in Cleveland. It was Pittsburgh against Cleveland. I had my camera on going and looking in the viewfinder. Terry Bradshaw is the quarterback. That shows you how long ago it was. He drops back to pass and I see a blur. It's Turkey Jones. 279 pounds, who picks up Terry Bradshaw, turns him over, and drops him on his neck and breaks his neck. Oh. My heart is going like this. Howard Cosell. You will not believe this shot. It's one of the dirtiest shots ever in the history of pro football. From that week on, I worked for 25 years for NFL Films. Films. Why? Because I was fired. I think it's so critical when you fail at something 
that you put a spin on it and you don't concentrate on what right. happened to make you fail, have you found that true in your life? Oh, it's the only way. It's, it's the only way. Because if you bury yourself in your failure, or you just consistently try to correct your mistakes rather than moving forward from them, you, you just get stuck in life. That's stuck. That's stuck. You know, that's stuck. And I, but, but, but that's an attitude that I think that you get because you either grew up with it, which I grew up with. You know, my mom was 4'8", Irish woman, <laughs> you know. You, and she, she, was, she could see good in everything. You know, you told her you got a bad grade. She says, well, it gives you an opportunity to get a better grade. I'm going, okay, Mom. Maybe it's a lousy teacher. She said, there's no lousy teachers. There's a lot of lousy students. Be a better student. The teacher will be a better teacher. Okay, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> you grow up with this stuff. <laughs> and she, she taught me that that's how it works. I said, okay. So every teacher I had knew who I was, even in college and postgraduate. I'd go up and I'd introduce myself to the teacher and I'd say, you know, I'm going to try real hard to understand you. No. <laughs> really? You did? I would say, I'm going to work real hard on this course. And if something I'm doing isn't helping me move ahead in what I need to learn, please help me out with that. Did One you? thing I get a lot from people is, how do I get paid for speaking? Now, people in Toastmasters are not paid, but people in Toastmasters have come to be a lot and said, how do you get paid speaking? Can you talk about that? Is there a way to get into speaking and be able to get paid for a speech? Well, uh, yes, I would say in retrospect, have priceable value. In other words, if what you're sharing affects a monetary situation for the client or the person, if I'm teaching you how to get a better job, if I'm coaching you to a new lifestyle, if I'm helping a business figure out what they need to be doing they're not doing, if I'm showing somebody some principle that helps them manage their business more effectively so they have a bottom line, those are the natural areas where you know, revenue comes to the speaker a little faster. Philosophically, it's a little different. So if you're talking philosophically about look on the inside, not on the outside, right. you need to anchor it in real life situations. So people go, wow, that's, that's a priceable value. It's a lot easier. The other thing is to, to seek out groups. There's thousands of groups. You know, I did, I did the whole nine yards with Rotary and Kiwanis and Optimus and all that. And certainly they don't pay. But there are people sitting there having lunch, listening to you speak, mm -hmm. who run a business who could pay you. The challenge is you don't know how to get the lead. So I came up with this little thing called PSK. And every time I speak to a group for, without a fee, I ask them if anybody in there has a group organization would like to hear how, have me speak to their group organization and what is it and give me their card. That, that controlled a third of my speaking. Those cards got me a third of my speaking. Isn't that 50? 50% 50 of my speaking engagements brought me another speaking engagement. 30% of my engagements came from somebody sitting in an audience who gave me their card. And 20% of my speaking engagements came from the sure energy that I built into my organization to ferret out speaking opportunities. But look where it came from. And then I hear people speak at Rotary, and, and I know they would like to have another speech, and they'd like to have some kind of check. And then, then you go into uh, language. You build language in, like somebody calls and they want me in Watertown, South Dakota. I like Watertown, South Dakota, in two weeks. And I said to the, I said to the gentleman uh, who called me, I said, uh, how much have you budgeted for the speaking engagement? And he said, well, I'll have to check on that. He called me back, and he gave me a number. Well, ask for what they budgeted. If they say no, fine. Yeah. You know, but that's one way, if, if you're new in the business, to try to start to gauge the, the value. The other thing is to gauge what people are being paid, and this sometimes is hard to get to, but bureaus and these websites can tell you. You can go there and find out what I'm being paid in a corporate environment. It's public information. And uh, they, they put down the price tag on yeah. the websites for the bureaus and agencies. And then, um, yeah. But, but the, the challenge is, if you are really good and your contract content is deliverable and it's priceable value, it's actionable today, they can go out and do something today, people will say, how much do you charge? They'll ask you that. They'll ask you to pay you. It's the same way with books. I've got a book that I don't sell. No, nope, I give it away. What and I get that? more. That's, that's uh, your true DNA. When I go speak, the book, I, get, I put in, as many books on the back table as in the audience, and I say, you can't buy this book from me. You buy this book from Barnes Noble, you go to Barnes Noble, you can buy the book. 
So why do you do to, this, Tom? Go to, uh, because I want... Because I don't want to put a price tag on the book. It's awesome. If you had to buy it, it was 20 bucks. It's awesome. If you want a book, take a book. If you want a book for a friend, take a book for a friend. If you want to support what I'm doing, there's an envelope next to the book. Put something in the envelope. Help me out. Fine. Great. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. But that's deliverable content. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's something that you deliver that has priceable value for them, so they want access to it, and they're will to, willing to contribute to the access. So Boy, there's, there's so many things you can do, I mean. These are answers to so many questions that people have right. about how do I get booked? What do I do? Well, how do I improve my Toastmaster speech? Yeah, the number one thing, the number one thing is to, to seek out people who are in your zone. In other words, if you have a message, who is the best audience member for your message? What are the five characteristics they have? Mine were dealers with more than 50 employees been in the business more than, than uh, a decade, and were in hard goods. That's uh, tractors, chainsaws. They were, they were working for manufacturers and had kids in the business. Those are my five characteristics. I know those people better than anybody else. I know their pain statements. I know their five pain statements. And that's why they hired me. They didn't hire me because I had the answers. They hired me because I knew them better than anybody else because I could touch them at a level that they had the pain in. People don't come to solutions. They come to people who understand their problems. This is a very important message for you to understand in all your material, is if you can tell me what I'm dealing with, I want to listen to you. If you want to tell me that you know me already and you got the solutions for me, I'm not going to listen to you. Help me better understand my problem before you have the right to give me my solution. You with me on that? Yeah. Bingo. So how many speeches do you think altogether you have given? 3,000, oh, they said. And yeah. then and after that, you've given speeches. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. And, I'm and probably you, up around 5,000. 5,000. How many this year? Well, I, I don't track it anymore. I'm probably going to do 60 or 80 this year. But they're in so many different environments. You know, I do these mini retreats, scooter retreats. I do a mission. You know what a mission is? That's where you go into a place you speak three or four times, and then you open the doors. Not anybody come for a couple of nights you, that they want to come in just to spend time with you. Uh, I'll get 600 people at a mission. I just did one in Baltimore on how you find you. That's the most popular topic that I do today. Who's you? You know? And, and why do you know who's you? Because if you don't know who you is, then how do you know what opportunities are coming to you? Because that's, that's, that's where life takes action. Life doesn't take action in possibilities. Possibilities are things you listed for yourself that you'll never get around to doing, and if you do, they're not gonna make it anyway. And if they do make it, they're probably some snippet of success that passed you by that, that you weren't meant to have anyway. No, opportunities versus possibilities. Every day something happens to us that's an opportunity. It's something we're drawn to with our gift, and we need to learn to recognize them, we need to learn to take action in them. And that's confirmation. That's what people wanna know. What am I missing today? What did I miss today? What have you learned the past five years that you didn't know before that made a difference in your life? Or that I knew and I, what did I learn? I learned I didn't have to do so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to remember. You that's know, great. You that got to really remember. Is. That really is. That, that's a great point, <coughs> that you don't have to do all the bucket list. You don't have no. to do all of it. No, you don't. And, you know, I'm a maniac. I'm consumptive. The reason, okay, so you sense this. I have a lot more energy than a guy my age, typically, all right? And the problem with that is you got to use it or you lose it. So I do lots of stuff I never would have had to do and so I can go home at night and say, I got a lot done. Whoopee. <laughs> now, if I go back and prioritize, with like the old, the old days of prioritization in your life, and take the ones, the twos, and the threes, and the ones are the ones I'm supposed to do based upon what, my, what I'm talented and gifted to do. The twos are the paperwork that support the ones, and the threes are junk mail, you know. <laughs> then, then rate your day. How much time did you devote that? Like for me, a one is writing. I should be writing 800 words three days a week. That gives me a book a year. I have not done that. <clears throat> I've written 3,000 articles and seven books, but I get so much joy. Like yesterday, I just took three to five yesterday afternoon, and I just went and wrote it for eight. Whatever was on my mind, I wrote it for 800 words. Whether anybody was going to get it or not, ever, you know, and I publish these Toms on Tuesdays and all that stuff. I could have filled that day with twos yesterday, paperwork, or threes. 
and, and, and gone home tired and felt like I had accomplished something and not felt fulfilled. All I did was take two hours yesterday and I went home so joyful last night that I was fulfilled because I did that one, the one thing I need to do today, the one person I need to talk to today, the one thing I need to address today, the one thing I need to get off my plate today, the one compliment I can give another person today and direct yourself there. Wow, it's huge. Wow. I worked with world-class sportscaster Dave Diles. He did the Indy 500 and a, a national sportscaster. And I worked with him five days a week. And every night before he left, he would take a piece of paper and he would write down his eight goals for the next day. There you go. And when he got there, he would get up, look at the list, and go like this. And the day wasn't over till they clicked all eight. Yeah, yeah. What a brilliant man. Yeah. But what a lesson to learn on goal setting where you, you have to think about it before and then you go in right. and you check it off. Right, right. Well, and you know, the, the, the theology of that is you start running then. In other words, you don't start in a stall. So the next day you're running already because you've got your list. Yeah. The challenge for that list idea is very popular and I've used it many, many times in my life. I actually... What's on the list? That's my day. John, John Go see John Gross. John Gross. Denise. Rewire the TV. <laughs> uh, uh, call the, call the, I'm speaking engagement on, on, on Friday. Call the meeting planner and tell him I'm coming. <laughs> awesome. Write. Three to five. What am I writing about? Let him decide, not you. Tom, we're going to start to wrap up. Before yeah. we do... I want you to go back to maybe one of the favorite stories that you tell at speeches. Yeah. It can be five minutes, seven minutes long, <coughs> and then we'll wrap it up. But something that you know always touches people's hearts. Something from the heart that you talk about and you speak about. And I just want to hear you like you were speaking to a group of people. Well, I'll share a signature story. The reality, the reality of my life is that sometimes I've discovered that if you don't tell people what they need to know, they're not going to know it. In other words, you have to language what you're doing. And I always use a story of a few years ago, I was, my goal was to get a new grill. So I shared with my wife I needed a grill. And so she decided to take upon herself to buy me a grill. So she went on, I married a coupon clipper. This is a, <laughs> this is a person who has garage sales and takes in $600 on $12,000 worth of inventory and is happy about it. And, and I love her dearly. We've been together for 38 years, <laughs> been married 38 years, four kids, four grandchildren. But, but, but if it ain't a great garage sale, and she's, you know, or she goes to the Mall of America and doesn't buy anything, I say, why didn't you buy anything? She says, because nothing was on sale. I go, okay. <laughs> buy something. <laughs> Make the trip worth it. And I'm not saying that's the correct attitude that I've got either. But, but I came home on my birthday that day from work, and this big, big box in the garage, all wrapped in the garage. And I thought, wow, I wonder what she came up with. So it said, open me now. So I did. I got up and I tore the paper off of it, and, and I'm a little excited, and it's a grill. It's a gas grill. 389,000 parts needs to be assembled <laughs> with a tool made by somebody I don't understand. <laughs> but I love her. So I put it together. I assembled it in our den. It took me seven days and 32 hours. I carried each part out of love, hate for the grill, love for her, into the den and put it together. I got it together in the den. It was too big to get out of the den. <laughs> Seriously. It weighed like 350 pounds. And, you know, I couldn't get through the doors. I had to take the doors off. Couldn't get through the doors. So we, I finally called the retailer back on the phone. I said, I got this grill and I can't get it out of my den and there's no wheels in the box. And the retailer said, well, you got to put it back in the box. you got to bring it back. I said, it's not coming back, and it ain't coming out of my den, and I need the wheels. So we kind of hung up, and I went to Ace's, a place over on Excelsior Boulevard. And, right. and uh, I called the guy and said, I've got this grill, and I've got no wheels for it. you got the, the, the wheels. And he said, well, I sell a lot of those wheels to people who put that grill together. How'd you do? <laughs> oh, I said, oh, thanks. So anyway, so I went over there and bought the wheels for about 60 bucks, and that's what she saved by buying the grill from the discount house where she bought it. So it was about $60 trade-off. So now I'm equal to what it would have cost her to just buy today's. 
And I said to the guy as I was leaving, I said, now there's my grill right there. That, that You sell the same grill the discounter sells. He said, yeah, but we can't sell them because they lower the price. And I said, can I tell you something? Did you put that grill together? Yep, 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 yep. I said, will you deliver that grill? Yep, yep, yep. Will you put a blue rhino tank on that grill for me if I pay you a little bit more? Yep, I'll do that. <laughs> will you deliver today? Yep, I'll do that. I said, and you're going out of business? That's worth more than 60 bucks to me. <laughs> Look what you don't tell people. You do all this for somebody, and you don't embed the language of your value in what you do when you connect with others. They don't know that you assemble that grill. They don't know you deliver that. They don't know that if your sign would say, you can cook on these today. Oh, they'd be awesome. Seriously. Seriously. And it's the same with us. Think about what you say to people. Think about the depth of the value that you bring to others. Think about how you share where they're at, not necessarily where you're at. And it changes your life. It changes your life. The biggest lesson you've learned in your life, I think you said you're 70, is that right? The answer to everything is love. I believe that. I believe that if we can learn to love without judgment, the world changes. No matter how much pain somebody has given us, the secret to life is to love, to not judge, to not judge. To not, that doesn't mean I need to agree with you, but I'm not going to judge you for what you believe. Those teachers, it would have been so easy to be so mad and upset. When did you forgive them and forgive that whole incident? It really was my junior and senior year of high school when I realized that what they had given me was a step ahead, not two steps behind. That, that I had been, I had applied to Northwestern in uh, theater and I had been accepted. I didn't end up going to Northwestern for theater, I ended up going to Marquette for broadcast journalism, worked at Channel 4. But when I got accepted at Northwestern, I realized the teachers had given me a uh, uh, move ahead. It was, there was a lot of competition for that. And I think it was more of them helping me understand who I was. And, and I think that's part of acting, theater, and maybe even broadcasting, especially if you're on this end of the mic, is you have to know who you are. And, and the, it's not of the character you play, but the character you are. That's why oftentimes you'll see stars play similar characters, because that's them. That's them. And I think that's what happened to me. Tom, you've been amazing. I'm so glad that you well, came. Thanks, John. Thanks Long for Long time invitation. friends from uh, Waterloo, Iowa and Cedar Falls, Iowa. You have a minute. Well, you're, the one, you're one of the greatest interviewers I know, John. How can anybody turn you down? You have one minute. What do you say? You have one minute to reach somebody. What would you say in one minute? I would say t 15 minutes today. Take 15 minutes today. Take a question that you've had difficulty with and put it in front of you and just mind map it for 15 minutes today, some question that's been eating at you. What does mind mapping mean? It's the ability to write down the question in the middle of the page and then every time you think about something that relates to that question, write something on the side. So you begin having these little convergent thoughts around it. And then step back from it and take a look at it and say, what's the message? Well, I did it yesterday. It said, leave it alone. Leave it alone. I am so glad It'll that you solve came. Itself. We have to find out, though, before you leave, how can people connect with you, contact you? Oh, it's easy. I'm very easy. <laughs> you got a pencil, write down my phone number. You can call me directly, 612-801-3194, 612-801-3194. If you want to email me, it's my name. It's thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S, at winninger.com, W-I-N-N-I-N-G-E-R.com. And if you just want to Google Winninger, it brings you right to me, too. So it's like social media. I don't have any, but I've got 43,000 locations in the Internet that I exist in. So, yeah, Winninger.com. Great. Perfect. You were awesome today, Thanks, John. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for watching. I'm John Gross.